thank Brother Bland for the kind words that he's um, mentioned on my behalf and, of course, for the invitation to come and to uh, speak uh, here this afternoon. Uh, of course, uh, enjoyed uh, greatly uh, the lessons that we've had thus far. I'm sure everyone here has, and I can't think of a better way, as Brother Bland has planned it, uh, for us to close out as we think about the words, Here am I, send me. Of course, from Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah is given a, a vision as he sees the Lord uh, upon his throne. And as he receives this vision, he uh, sees the train that fills up uh, the temple. He sees the, the, the seraphims there that are uh, there uh, crying out to one another about, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and how the whole earth is full of his glory. How the very post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And as he's granted this vision, he sees how insignificant, how small he really is as he cries out in verse 5, Woe is me! Uh, he, he, in comparison of himself to God, he, he says, I'm one of unclean lips. Of course, that angel reaches out and, and takes that coal and puts it to his lips and says that he is now purified. And then there in verse 8, he hears the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And the only thing that Isaiah can do in response is to say, here am I, send me. And we think about the great lessons that we've heard so far about the great works that are being, are being done in the world. And we think about ourselves and what we need to do as Christians, not just in the world as a whole, that we think about going across the world and doing evangelism, but even our own personal evangelism at home, which is such a needed task as well. We need to have the same mindset that Isaiah did of, here am I, send me. But the problem that tends to happen so often is we've got the here am I part down, but it's the send me that we don't. And this afternoon, I want us to look at three different responses that we can have as Christians whenever God, he's still asking the question, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? The question is still there. As for all of us here today, he's asking that question. And whenever we decided to become Christians, we told him, here am I. We've all got that part down, but the second part is the part that we really need to focus on and answer for ourselves this afternoon as we think about that. I think about the different ways that we can answer that question. And I think about that number one is sometimes we say, here am I, don't send me. Whenever I think about this mindset, I think this is oftentimes the mindset of Christians. Too often Christians have the mindset of Jonah when it comes to evangelism. You remember Jonah in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3? Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. He needed a man. He needed someone to go to Nineveh. And so he tells Jonah, Get up and go, that great city, cry against it. Their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare thereof. He went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And too often I think that's the mindset that most Christians have. Whenever we uh, immerse ourselves in the waters of baptism, we come up that new creature. Uh, sometimes we have that fire for a little bit. But then it comes time for us to say, uh, here am I, send me. And that might be just going next door to our neighbors and telling them about how they need the gospel. But instead, I have in my mindset, here am I, but you know what, don't send me. I know I'm a Christian. I know this is my responsibility, but don't send me. I don't want to go. We're like Jonah and we flee. And instead of going toward uh, where we're supposed to be going towards God, instead we get up and we run the opposite direction. We get up and we run away from the responsibility that God has given to us that we are required to fulfill as Christians. And so instead of going God's way, we try to run and flee the opposite way. And we know, of course, Jonah and going to Tarshish, he's going as far away as possible as he can from the presence of the Lord. He's supposed to go up here to Nineveh. He knows how evil and wicked this people is, these people are. He knows about uh, this great wickedness that God's talking about. Uh, but God tells him it's time for them to know that they need to repent. And I'm sending you to go and tell them that. And instead, he says, I'm going the opposite way. I'm going as far away as I can from this responsibility. Don't send me. 
Okay, you need, to, you need to get somebody else for this. We're going to talk about that later as well. Of course, we know what happened with Jonah on that way. He was swallowed by that great fish. But we know we're not going to likely be swallowed by a great fish today. I'm not going to rule that out. <laughs> it might happen to someone someday. Uh, but most likely, we're not going to be swallowed by a great fish. But the church needs a wake-up call, just like Jonah did, of the vows that we have taken as Christians. Think about uh, Jonah himself, Jonah 2. In verse 4, after he was swallowed by that great fish, and he's starting to realize what he needs to do, now he says, Then said I, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. Drop down to verse 9, But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Jonah knew he had made a vow unto the Lord that he was going to preach the truth. And whenever he went back on that vow, he needed to be woken up and reminded of the vow that he had taken for God. Go to chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, but notice it's the same thing. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. God says, I haven't changed anything. You're supposed to get up. You're supposed to go and preach what I told you to preach the first time. But notice the response this time in verse 3. So Jonah arose... And went unto Nineveh. Hey, according to the word of the Lord, now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days journey, large city to go and preach to. But this time he went as God had told him to. And so we know that Jonah, of course, had that wake up call and he responded in the correct way. He had some other issues, of course, throughout the book that we don't have time to talk about. But we think about ourselves as Christians. What about our vows? What about the, the commitments we made as Christians to God? Romans 6, 3 and 4, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I made a commitment when I decided to become a Christian I decided that I'm going to be like Christ. I decided that I'm going to pick up his mission. Verse 22 of Romans 6, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. When I became a Christian, I made a vow unto God that I'm his servant. He tells me I need to go. I better get up and go. He's told me that that's my requirement to follow him we think about the importance of vows ecclesiastes 5 and verse 5 always comes to mind better is it that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay and of course we use that often with wedding vows and things of that nature but it's true of christians as well if i've told god that i'm i'm ready to become a christian i'm ready to go into this world and to preach christ and yet i become a christian and yet i stay silent then I've backed out of the vow that I made to God when I became a Christian. Better would it have been for me to have not vowed at all than to say I'm a Christian and to never proclaim Christ at all. I've got to make sure I'm doing my responsibility as that Christian. But we think about ourselves. We live busy lives. I'm going the wrong way there. We live busy lives as Christians, and what happens? We let things get in the way of our work for God. Well, I've got to watch this TV show. I've got to watch this ball game. I've got to make sure I make that. Well, I'm going fishing this Saturday, so I can't go door knocking. I've got to make sure the garden's watered. I've got this sporting event. Can't make Wednesday night. I've got this sporting event. My child's got to go to this sporting event. So I can't make this Sunday night. Can't make the gospel meeting. We let these things get in the way, and we let those become our excuse for not doing our work as Christians. It's something that is plaguing our land among Christians that instead of standing up and saying, I'm a Christian, I've made a vow to spend my time for God, and yet I'm going to instead choose to use my time elsewhere. I have better for me not to have vowed at all than to have said that I'm going to vow and not go through with it. Say, I'm a Christian. Here am I, send me. But instead we say, here am I, don't send me. And there is something very wrong in my mind Whenever I think about preachers, whenever I think about elders and Christians as a whole, there is something very wrong about an elder, a preacher, or even just a Christian who spends more time fishing, more time playing golf, more time gardening than they do evangelizing. There is something very, very wrong with that. There is a responsibility that's there, and the same can be true of, you've heard the term, retired Christians. 
I've done my time teaching. I've done my time being a Bible class teacher. I've done my time as a song leader. I'm retired now. I should never be in the mindset of a Christian. We don't retire. You remember what the book of Hebrews teaches? There remaineth therefore a rest. But where's that rest? It's in heaven. Therefore, let us work. Let us labor to enter into that rest. I've got to work as I'm here and I have time to be able to do that. And yet, instead, we sit in idleness and the Lord's work. We say, here am I. I'm a Christian. But instead of saying, send me, we say, don't send me. I've got too many other things to do. I'm too busy, God, to fulfill what you require of me. Don't send me. Now, you know what? I, I don't have time for this, but I'm a Christian. I've made that vow. See, if we refuse the work that's been given to us, there's going to be uh, something to pay for that, which we'll mention in just a minute. But every Christian has a responsibility in evangelism. We know Matthew 28 and verse 19, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, of course, most of us know Ivan Stewart's book, Go Ye, means go me. Those words still ring true today. This commission is for all Christians. It wasn't just for the apostles. Did they follow through with it? Yes. But so did the ones that they taught, and the ones that they taught, and the ones that they taught. And the same is true for us today. Go ye therefore means I must go, and I'm a Christian. I have to go. And we cannot run from that charge. We're going to talk again about that more a little bit later on as well. But if we refuse the work that we have been given uh, sometimes we don't see the ultimate end of what that means. But if we refuse this work, the blood of those around us, it's going to be on our hands. Ezekiel 3, 18 and 19. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked of his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Verse 19, yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, same thing, but thou hast delivered thy soul. If we don't do our job as Christians, the work that we've been given as God to go and to proclaim the gospel to every creature, their blood is on our hands. There are people that I come into contact with that I might be the only Christian they ever know. And if I don't tell them about the gospel, if I don't tell them about Christ, who has to answer for that in judgment? It's not any of those other people. It's not even any of the other Christians who never knew this person. That's me. I have to answer for that. Their blood is on my hands. And I pray often that I never lose an opportunity to tell somebody about the gospel because I don't want that on me in the judgment day. I think about with Paul in Acts 20 and verses 25 to 27, as he talks to the Ephesian elders, he says, Behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Paul says, I'm clean. Why? Because he did his job as a Christian. He proclaimed unto them the whole counsel of God, therefore he knew he had done his job. Does that mean that everybody responded positively? Absolutely not. But does that mean that he did his job? Yes. He warned the wicked. And if they still choose to die in their iniquity, that's on them. But Paul's hands are now clean of that blood. But if he chose not to tell them the gospel, to teach them about Christ, then that blood's on, their, on his hands. And that blood is on our hands as well. Think about all the neighbors that we have around us and our own communities. How many of them have we gone to and taught the gospel? As the church that's there in our community, how many doors have we knocked? Have we gone to every member of that community and told them about the gospel of Christ? If we haven't, that blood's on our hands. We've got to make sure that we are going and teaching the gospel of Christ wherever we go as Christians. Again, we made the vow. Here am I, but so often we say, don't send me. I'm too busy. I don't want to do that. I don't like doing that. This pew is a little too comfortable for that. I'm going to stay here. No, if we're going to be Christians, real Christians, then we have to say, here am I, send me. And so hopefully we don't have the mindset like those do of Jonah where they say, don't send me. But number two, there's another mindset that people have. Some will say, here am I, but send someone else. Okay, here am I, 
but send someone else. This is the mindset that some have that's like Moses. They approach their evangelism like Moses did when he started. Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 to 13 where it uh, reads, And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. That sound familiar? <laughs> I'm not good at Bible studies. I'm not good at teaching people the gospel. That sounds exactly like what Moses said. I'm not eloquent. Neither heretofore since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I'm slow of speech. I'm not a very good teacher. And of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind, have not I the Lord? Verse 12, now therefore go. He says, go anyway, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou wilt say. But then Moses responded, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom thou wilt send. He said, Lord, send someone else. Uh, it's not for me. I need you to send someone else instead of me. And that's the, t the way that many Christians... Uh, view their evangelism as well. When Moses was told to go, his response was, I'm not good enough. That's what so many people believe today about themselves. I'm not good enough to sit down and have a Bible study with someone. I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not good enough to do that. I can't lead a public prayer. I can't lead singing. Well, how do you get better at it? You practice it. Nobody's good overnight. Uh, I used to hate leading singing. I uh, never thought I'd ever do it. But what happened? Practice. Forced into it at the Memphis School of Preaching. <laughs> and what happened? You get used to it. You get better at it and you grow. And now you, you get to something that you do all the time. Same thing with evangelism. It might start off a little rough, but as you practice and get better, it becomes second nature. So we can't use this mindset that I'm just not good enough. If you're not good enough, get better. That's what we do as Christians. We grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord. See, too many Christians use the same excuse when it comes to the work of the Lord. I'm not good enough. Well, if I know what I did to be saved, can't I tell someone else? Obviously, I should. If I know what it required of me to be saved, then I should be able to tell someone else. If I can't, I might want to make sure I'm saved. If I don't know what I did to be saved and I can't tell somebody else that, how do I know I'm saved? So I better make sure that, that I know so that I can teach someone else. And if I don't know how to go and to set up a Bible study, I don't know what materials to use, as we saw in our uh, last lesson, uh, the things that are able to be used. You go and you get those things. You go through them yourself. You practice. You get a partner. You have them role play with you. You train yourself, and you grow. We can't just keep using the same excuse, however, I'm not good enough, and then just pass it on to someone else. If I just keep using that excuse, what's going to happen when it comes to the day of judgment? Lord, I know I had all this time to improve and to get better, but, you know, I just wasn't good at it, so I just didn't do it. I sound like the one with the one talent who went and hid his talent in the earth and said, well, here it is. I didn't do anything with it, but here you go. Uh, what happened to him? Of course, we know it wasn't a very good response from his Lord, and so we can't keep using this excuse. See, an excuse used far too often among Christians is that someone else is better suited for the task. No, don't send me. You know, so-and-so, they're so much better at that. So-and-so is so much better at public speaking. So-and-so is such a much better song leader. They're so much better at talking to people. They're so much better at this or that. And we use that as our crutch, as our excuse to not do anything. Well, okay, they're better at you than that. But if I'm only comparing myself to others, there's always going to be somebody that's better than me at something. And so if I keep doing that, I'm going to keep finding excuses uh, to, to not do what God has required of me. I need to stop using excuses and make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do myself. You see, not everyone has the same abilities. There from that parable in Matthew 25, 14 and 15 about the talents, the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. I know not everybody has the same abilities. I understand that. But we all still have abilities. We all still have things that we can do, and there are things on which we can improve as well. We still have to use what we have. There, for the rest of that chapter, found out that the man with five went and made five other. The one with two went and made two other. The one with the one went and buried it. The two that went and made gain, of course, they were rewarded by their Lord when he returned. But the one that did not, 
who just simply went and buried it, he was told that he was a wicked and slothful servant. And he was reserved, of course, into the darkness and to the gnashing of teeth uh, to be cast into. And so even though we have different abilities, we need to recognize that we still have abilities and that there are things that we have that we can use to uh, help in the work of the Lord. See, but many what they try to do is they try to push the work of evangelism on the preacher. They try to push that onto the elders because it's not my job. That's the preacher's job. That's the elder's job. That's what they're supposed to be doing. But remember, we're Christians. Whenever we became Christians, we said, that's my job. Whenever I became a Christian, I became a servant of God. I became a Christ gen. I became one who is proclaiming Christ wherever I go. Again, that go ye means go me. And so I can't keep using the excuse of send someone else. I've got to send myself. I've got to make sure that I'm doing my responsibility as a Christian, keeping up my end of the bargain. Again, I've made the vow. And am I going to keep that vow or am I going to reject it? See, this responsibility of evangelism falls on every Christian. And we will not be able to reach heaven solely on the work of others. Think about Philippians 2 and verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Just because my preacher's a great evangelist, just because the elders are great evangelists, just because my spouse is a great evangelist and I sit back and do nothing, doesn't mean that I get to go to heaven on their coattails. Okay, just because my parents were great evangelists, just because my grandparents were whoever it was, I have to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. This is a responsibility on every Christian, and it's something that we all need to take seriously because it's something that's, again, required of all of us. And if I'm not taking that responsibility seriously, then I have to answer for that in judgment. So I've got to make sure, again, that I'm striving to be my best, to do what I can, and to see where my strengths are, and to be able to go and to proclaim the gospel wherever I can to every creature. Again, there are those that I come into contact with that other people may never uh, uh, come into contact with, that there's no other Christian that's ever going to be in their life. It's just going to be me. And if I don't tell them the gospel, I don't preach the gospel of Christ to them, tell them about Jesus, then who will? And again, that blood's going to be on my hands if I refuse. And so we think about these two negative responses, and yet these two responses seem to be what most Christians uh, tend to, to fall back on. Well, here am I, I'm a Christian, but don't send me. I'm too busy, or I'm just not good enough, or I just don't want to. Or it's here am I, but send someone else. They're better at it than I am. They're better at this than I am. That's the preacher's job. That's the elder's job. I'm just going to sit back here and do this. Yeah, we've got to get those mindsets out of us and get to the third one, which is the one that we're looking at here this afternoon, of here am I, send me. This is the attitude that we need to have. This is the mindset that all Christians need to have, is that of Isaiah when it comes to evangelism. Again, there from our text, Isaiah 6, 8, and 9, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And again, that, that, that question is still for us today. And we need to have the response that he had. Then said I, Here am I, send me. And then God responded to him, what was the response? Go and tell this people. And he tells them what he needs to tell them. And so if I'm going to be a Christian or uh, a real true Christian, then I need to have this attitude of here am I, send me. See, when God told Isaiah he needed a man to work, Isaiah responded, I'm ready. Now, here am I, send me. And of course, we think about what Isaiah had just seen there in chapter 6. He had just been given and granted this vision of God filling up the temple okay, with these angels who are here proclaiming how holy he is. The very post of the door are shaking at the voice. It's filled with smoke. And we see this great image. And then God says, now I need someone to go and tell the people about this. Uh, Isaiah's immediate response is, me, <laughs> uh, send me. And that's the type of response that we need to have. We need to, if we want to really get motivated for evangelism personally and over the world is we need to remember how great and holy God is. If I get that in the proper perspective, my automatic response should be like Isaiah. No hesitation, here am I, send me. If I get my mind right about who God is, 
then I can get my mind right about evangelism. I know how great, how holy God is. I know his response to sin. I know how serious hell and punishment is. And because of those things, I want to tell as many people as I can. I've got to get my mind focused on that right thing. I've got to make sure that I'm ready as Isaiah uh, said that he was. And so again, God has the same need today. He's still asking the question, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Well, what's my response? I've got the here in my part. I've got that part down. I'm a Christian. Now the question comes, what's the, what's the latter end of that? What's my second response? Is it don't send me? Is it send someone else? Or is it send me? And what's my response? Am I ready? Am I ready like Isaiah was to go and to preach and to proclaim the gospel to those that were in need. See, but again, the problem that we face so often today is that when someone becomes a Christian, uh, we think about what I've been mentioning this whole time. When you become a Christian, you go into those waters of baptism, you rise up that new creature. You're no longer that old man of sin. Now you're something new. You're something dedicated to God. You're his servant. We tell God, here am I, send me. That's, what the, that's, that's part of that, that focus of being that new creature is I'm now a servant of God. What do you need me to do? Okay, what's my responsibility? What, what, do I, what do you need me to do from here? And, of course, God has told us that in his word about living faithfully, going and proclaiming the message and everything that goes along with it. So when I become a Christian, I let God know, here am I, send me. But too often what happens in the church is that when one obeys the gospel, the church says, you know what, that's good. Here's your, your scriptural seat in the pew. Okay, now you don't ever have to get out of it. And if someone tries to take it from you, you can go and kick them out of it. Okay, that's what the church is trying to, to do. And I'm not trying to badmouth the church, but so often this is what we do. We put people into the waters of baptism, we sit them on the pew, and then they never get up. We just let them sit there and, and just molder into a, a Christian that's just one that's just filling a seat. And that's not the point of Christianity. It's not to get into a, a seat on the pew and to just sit there and to never get up. Okay, the point of being a Christian is once you go into that waters of baptism, of course you come to the worship services as we're supposed to, but then you go out and you take that message to everybody that you come into contact with. We think about our responsibilities. We've got to get over our fear, uh, number one, to be able to do this. To be able to get up and to get out where we need to be, we've got to get over fear. Uh, whenever I think about uh, people in the Bible that I feel like I really connect with, those that are, we sometimes say is my favorite uh, character in the Bible or something like that, uh, one for me is Gideon. Uh, for several different reasons. Uh, one, he tells me it's okay to ask questions. <laughs> uh, whenever uh, God tells him, he, he, uh, he tells God to uh, have the fleece uh, damp and then the, the ground dry, but now I'm going to reverse that. It's okay to qu have questions and to want some evidence. We think about Thomas. Sometimes we call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas just wanted some evidence. <laughs> he wanted to have that evidence that he could know what the other apostles were saying was true. And whenever I think about Gideon, one thing about him as well tells me something about fear. In Judges chapter 7, about getting over fear, this is something that's so comforting to me. Uh, that I've picked up on here. Judges 7, verse 9. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Gideon, this is after he's already shrunk down his army to the 300, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But then notice verse 10. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Phura thy servant down to the host. So he tells Gideon, you go down there and do what I've told you to do, but if you're afraid, you take your servant with you. But then look at verse 11. Here's what's important. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward thy hand shall be strengthened to go to the host. Then notice this part. Then went he down with Phura his servant to the men of the host. What did God just say? If you're afraid, take him with you. What did he do? He took him with him. Why? He was afraid. He was still nervous. He was still a little scared. And so he told him, take someone with you. Take someone that's going to help strengthen you and to get you through this. And that's so true of evangelism as well, is sometimes you just need somebody there with you. You need that spouse 
who's there to help lift you up and to exhort you. Think about uh, Aquila and Priscilla, that great uh, uh, godly couple who were always there together, going and proclaiming the message of God where they went. They worked together in that. What we think about here, he needed someone to help to strengthen him. And of course, he was going to be given that prophecy as well that was going to help strengthen him uh, also. But he took his servant with him. Why? He needed some encouragement. And so we've got to learn ourselves. We know that we're not supposed to have a spirit of fear, that the fearful and the unbelieving, of course, have their place uh, in in, uh, hell itself. But we as Christians, you know, sometimes we're nervous about something. Sometimes we're a little scared about something. The difference is we get over it. Okay, we've got to get over that fear. We've got to get past being scared, and that's so true of evangelism. Sometimes we're so scared to knock on that door for the first time that we never do it. Take someone with you. Find your fura <laughs> and take him with you and go and knock on the door and get over that fear. And the more that we do it, the easier it becomes. And that doesn't have to be, again, traveling halfway across the world to do this. That can be going next door and knocking on the next door neighbor. Uh, and getting over this fear that we have of evangelism. But so often, uh, we as Christians, we have this fear. Uh, We're scared to go out and to tell others about Christ because we're nervous about a door being closed in our face. We're scared about someone saying something ugly to us. But then I go back and I think about the lessons we've had today, especially Brother uh, Posey. If he's willing to go through what he went through for the cause of Christ... I think I can have a door or two slammed in my face and be okay. I think I can make it, if he can make it through what he did. And so, again, we've got to get over the fear. We've got to get out of our seats. We can't just be pew fillers. That's not the job of a Christian. The job of a Christian is to get out of that pew and to go and take the gospel to every creature. So we've got to get over our fear. We've got to get out of our seats, and we've got to get to preaching the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, of course, in verse 15. Or Mark mentions, go ye into all the world, of course, recording Jesus, and preach the gospel to every creature. So that's our responsibilities as Christians. As we kind of think about it and close out these thoughts here this afternoon, Brother Ivan Stewart, in his book, Go Ye Means Go Me, pointed out this question, and I think it's a question we all need to ask ourselves and to be reminded of. He posed the question, will Christians be surprised in judgment? that the Lord meant what he said when he commanded his followers to go as well as to be baptized. And that took me a minute to really understand what he was getting at, but what he's saying is we preach all the time baptism for the remission of sins, and that is essential. But what we fail to do is to remember the earlier part of that verse. He also told us to go, and that command is just as important as being baptized. I must be baptized for the remission of my sins, yes. But if I'm not going and telling the world the good news, the gospel, then I have failed in my duty as a Christian. I have taken a vow when I became a Christian that I'm going to be a servant of God. I'm going to go and to teach others about Christ. And if I refuse to do that or if I neglect to do that, then again, it would have been better not to have vowed at all. And so when we think about it for ourselves, we've got the first part down, here am I, but what's my response this afternoon? Is my response, don't send me, I'm too busy, I don't want to, I'm too scared? Is it uh, send someone else, they're better at it than I am, never wanting to grow myself? Or is my response, Lord, here am I, send me? We need to make sure our minds are right, get focused on the right attributes of God, make sure we understand who he is, what he's Uh, told us to do, and then we need to get to it. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon.